All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Todd Green, and we are starting our ninth uh, ninth edition, I think the 10th year that we've done Business Matters. Um, it started with music, and we've done a, a full circle back to music again. Is it because I love music? Yes, it is, but also because it's important to talk about. Um, so we will begin tonight um, with our land acknowledgement. Um, so we begin by acknowledging the land on which Brock is situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, uh, many of whom continue to live and work here today. Uh, this territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and it was within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. So again, um, I am Todd Green. I, I teach marketing here at Brock University. Um, tonight is brought to you by the Wilmot Foundation and it's part of the DG Wilmot um, Leader Series. We are covering AI and its impact on music. Um, obviously there's a lot of discussion about AI. I'm not going to do a lot of the contribution to the discussion, which is probably nice for any of my students or former students watching uh, right now. Um, what I'm going to have um, each of the panelists is just introduce yourselves and then we'll get um, going right away. I should also let those know who are watching live that you can um, submit your questions. So we'll, we'll talk for about an hour and then we'll, we'll give about 30 minutes for Q&A um, approximately. Sorry, one last thing I want to take, just say thank you to Susan, Kate and Erica from the marketing department. They're always really, really fun to work with and very supportive and, and I always look forward to this event every year. So um, through no specific orders, uh, Kirsten, you're the you're on my left, like right in front of me right now. So I'll have you <laughs> introduce yourself first and then we'll go uh, Noah, Eric and Chelsea based on what I'm seeing on this screen. Super, thank you, Todd, and thanks for having me. Um, my name is Kirsten Robertson. I am an associate professor at the University of the Fraser Valley. And a lot of my research looks at meaningful work and occupational calling. So why people feel destined to do a particular job. And along those lines, some of my recent research has been with musicians, both professional musicians and people who are turning their music calling into a career. Um, so very interested in this discussion. Great, thanks so much. Noah. Uh, my name is Noah Mintz. Um, actually, Brock University is my alma almost matter. <laughs> I did one one full year there and dropped out to join a rock band. <laughs> cool life. Um, I'm a mastering engineer at Lacquer Channel Mastering. Lacquer Channel is celebrating 50 years next year. And uh, I guess how I, I fit into the AI discussion is that um, there is a lot of AI mastering right now. In fact, there's last count about 35 websites that offer AI mastering, unlike all the other uh, audio engineering disciplines. So um, it's if it's under threat or not is a question, but um, it, that's, that's my fitting. Great. Yeah. And I actually saw you talking about AI on, on Facebook and that's why I was like, perfect. Okay. Amazing panelist. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Eric. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Alper. I am a music industry publicist. I work with independent bands and bands that have sold millions of albums around the world, ranging from The Wiggles to Slash to Jerry Lee Lewis, um, Sesame Street, among many, many others. I'm also the host of At That Eric Alper Show on Sirius XM. And the reason why I'm here is because I am a bot that is created by AI. <laughs> so lifelike, though. <laughs> oh, okay. no, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing what they can do right now they're yeah. this this bot is a lot funnier than the real eric alper he's a lot smarter and taller <laughs> nice yeah we can we can all be as tall as we want one day with it with AI, i guess <laughs> um chelsea hi my name is chelsea moss and i work in the music industry at the canadian independent music association and just a little bit about us we're a not-for-profit trade um, association uh, we're member based so our members include um, basically all sorts of companies that cover everything in sound recording 
Um, we kind of act as like the collective voice and leadership role in the development and advocacy of policies and services to protect and improve the viability of uh, our industry. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Um, and I should mention, uh, Kirsten and I are going to be working on a project related to AI and, and musicians as well. And that's sort of how we connected with Chelsea. So we're, we're excited about that, that collaboration as well. Yeah, um, just so we can show that there, there is something related to my day job for the, it's not just because <laughs> I like talking about music for an hour with cool people. Um, all right. So the first question is fairly broad, but it was an intentionally designed that way. So do you see AI as being a, a net positive or a net negative when it comes to musicians? And then what about the music industry as, as a whole? So you all work with a number of different stakeholders where what sort of pros and cons do you see of, of AI for the industry? I'll go first. Sure. <clears throat> um, I, what I'm finding as of March the 27th, 2024, is it really depends on what side of the area you're on. Um, there's certainly a lot of artists that not that are not really afraid of using AI because chances are they've been using technology that is well beyond their brain power since they were born. Um, they've been using um, and listening to artists like the Beatles who were able to use technology that were light years ahead of what everybody else had to offer, backwards masking on guitar solos, having you know, going from four track to eight to 16 track to 128 tracks in their lifetime is something that technology has been able to help a group like that back in 1964, 65. And then we realized that in 2023, the Beatles again were number one around the world with their charts with now and then. But what was interesting about when we first all heard that the Beatles were using AI, AI technology was that when Paul McCartney first announced that they were using it, there was a lot of fear out there. There was a lot of skepticalism out there because people thought, oh, we don't want to have John Lennon sing lyrics that he never sung because the the experience was a bunch of goofballs in university dorms were making David Bowie do duets with The Weeknd, singing Nirvana songs. And that was really scary because it was kind of like, okay, well, if they can do this for them, what can they do for your average human being? But then Paul McCartney came out and said, no, 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 all we want to do is use the technology that the Get Back documentary showed is that it's able to separate the noise and the sound that we don't want to the sound that we want. It related it to baking a cake, that if you have a chocolate cake, AI can help you separate the eggs and the batter and the chocolate and the yeast and everything, separate them all and put it all in together. And then a whole bunch of artists were like, and fans were like, oh, this is really, really good. Since that moment that he actually revealed what they were using it for, a whole slew of momentum started in my eyes about using AI technology to the point now where there was a study being done at the end of last year with Billboard magazine that said that almost 35% of all the songs that are right now on the Billboard Hot 100 are using some form of AI technology to help them finish off lyrics, to help them create new music to it, um, Noah can speak on this incredibly well about using it in the studio. So I don't even think it's a matter of if it's good or bad. I think the audience will always decide whether or not if they want it. And so far, they're pretty keen on artists and, and society using it because we're so used to it. We use AI on Spotify to figure out what songs we want to listen to. AI is used on Netflix to decide what kind of films we want to watch. We A lot of people don't know that AI is already used in our daily lives with Google and other sources. So I think it's not even a question of good or bad. I think it's here to stay. Now, how do we deal with it? Hmm. Yeah, anyone else? Okay, I can speak. Yeah, I, yeah for me, um, okay, the goal here is not to rant about anything. So it's like, because I, I can do that when it comes to AI. I've, I've talked, spoken extensively about it. And, um, the first thing is, okay, so the answer to the question is it net negative, net, net positive? It's for, for audio engineering, it's definitely a net negative. 
for the artists and creators in that positive. Now I'm talking about the same technology. Now, first off, AI. Is it AI? That's the big question. Hmm. Um, I, I, I've used all these models, like every single website that offers this audio engineering mastering that I do, I tried them all. And they're so easy to trick. They're so easy to, to just, I just basically call shenanigans on them being AI. I don't even think they're machine learning. There's no control. There's no like good mastering or bad mastering other than what the user decides. So I don't really think it's it's AI as much as it's, it's some sort of algorithm. And mastering's a very easy target for that because it's always been the dark art of, of audio engineering. Nobody knew what it, it was. So here's all these technology companies that come in, offer mastering, and say it's AI. I don't really think it's AI, but nonetheless, uh, the tools I've been able to use for AI have been quite positive. There's a, a software called Ozone, and more often than not, I'm using it to see what it would do to compare. Now, for the user, for the end user, for the musician who's going on these websites and using AI software, they're Probably more people doing that that are hiring professional mastering engineers right now. It's okay. The problem is educating people on what mastering is not. So eventually you get to a point where pe more people accept that that's what mastering is. And then I have to start doing, modeling what the, uh, emulating what the AI, these a AI models are doing, even though what they're doing is completely wrong, not, you know, 60, 70 years of mastering tradition. They're doing something completely different. So it retrains people's brains to believe this is what music should sound like. When in the end, every single one of them don't sound very good. They're missing a big element, which we can talk about later, I'm sure in our discussion, which is the human element that's thing. And in mastering the human element is really important. So for me, for the audio engineer, it's definitely a net negative, not because it's competition, but because it re-educates people to uh, something that's an inferior product. Yeah, maybe I could give like an industry perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now, I think I would probably say it's a net negative for the industry. As I was working out what kind of points I could use for this answer, I could only come up with really one positive, and it's for like industry workers like me to use chat GPT to, you know, make our lives a little less miserable and with technical <laughs> writing and things like that. But um, our sort of like biggest concern at SEMA with certain piece of AI models is the fact that we're it's the text and data mining, it's the data scraping, it's the fact that these things are fed like so much copyrighted work and that's not financially compensated. And we're like basically building models off the exploitation of you know musicians' work. Um and we just don't know like how current copyright frameworks are going to sort of deal with this stuff, but sort of where we've landed so far is that we think that these data sets, there should be some sort of transparency around what's being used, um, that this is also a licensable right, so that we should license, you know, they should pay us for licenses basically, or the rights holders not for licenses, not, not SEMA, obviously. Um, the other thing that I was sort of thinking of too, being a bit of a net negative uh, beyond like lack of transparency and financial compensation and using copyrighted works to build these models um, is the fact that like major music companies are investing like big money into these models to like produce a lot of commercial music, which could you know, have an impact on like flooding the market and reinforcing sort of power structures that are already there. Mm -hmm. To pick up uh, where Chelsea left off too, that's something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of the people I've talked to is so many musicians who are working in Canada are already struggling to survive. They're making huge sacrifices in order to pursue their music. And to the extent that AI may take some of those opportunities away and make it even more difficult to make a name for yourself or to sort of break out of all of the noise and to gain recognition in Canada, certainly that makes me nervous that there will be a small group who bear a lot of the cost of AI while some of the, the larger entities will enjoy most of the benefits of it. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I would say we've sort, sort of seen that with streaming services already. Um, I know, I mean, it, it, this isn't meant to be about streaming necessarily as well, but um, yeah, I think if it's under 1,000 plays now, 
there's no royalties being paid out to artists with songs that are less than a thousand plays per year. So there was already that kind of, I don't want to say it was sort of like a goal <laughs> to get rid of <laughs> lower end musicians. I'm not saying that. Um, but yeah, even nine years ago, we were talking about sort of the disappearance of the middle class of musicians and, and how viable it is for musicians to make a living solely from, from recorded music, mm -hmm. for example. No, I mean, COVID made that even more difficult and so on and so on. And we'll leave Ticketmaster alone um, for now, <laughs> Live Nation and so on. Um, so Eric, you mentioned about the Beatles and I can admit that I was pretty nostalgic when that, that song came out, even though, but also I was skeptical to your point, like, is this, uh, you know, like, is this a robotic version of John Lennon that they're using for this song? And I was really worried. And then I, he explained, I think he did have to sort of explain and back track a little bit like no no we got the stems of John Lennon singing in his apartment so this is him um I, is this going to be a, a flood of songs from artists who are either deceased or members of bands who is is this a new way to make money are we going to see forgotten albums from the vault I mean I know that in the past the way was to say hey now it's a box set or now it's reissued or it's the 20th anniversary remastered edition and, and things like that or new formats and so on. Is this going to be a new revenue stream or a lot of nostalgia you think coming coming out of this? Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, all you have to do is just take a look at the deal that have been made with venture capitalists and third party companies buying up the catalog of artists ranging from Michael Jackson to Neil Young to Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan and Genesis and Pete and Roger from The Who, those companies who now own the rights to exploit their master recordings and their likeness in some cases using the name and their logos, um, they're going to want their money back and they're going to want it fast because they basically paid for the valuation of it times 10, meaning that if Neil Young was generating four to five million dollars a year for the last 20 years worth of his music then that would be worth to these third-party companies anywhere between 40 and 50 million dollars that they would have to at least pony up to somebody like a neil young or a Joni mitchell in order to just come to the table for it um one of the big reasons why we saw a lot of these heritage and veteran artists sell their catalogs in the last seven or eight years mostly was because one, I mean, one reason not immune to AI was that Joe Biden was going to close a tax loop and allowing artists to collect one sum of money and pay an 18% tax as opposed to starting in January this year when it was going to be over 35%. But the big other reason that we're going to see AI being used is because not only do those companies want to exploit those catalog everything from looking at Springsteen on Broadway to help make, make back money, the ABBA Mamma Mia films and so forth, where Prince's estate just signed off this week on a jukebox theatrical run of, of you know, an off-Broadway performance. But who wouldn't want to go see Roy Orbison live in virtual reality using AI technology <clears throat> from 1965? Who wouldn't want to see David Bowie in 1973 from the Ziggy Stardust era. I mean, these are going to be heavy, heavy implications that these lawyers and that these estate rights holders have been making deals for 10 years that are salivating over everybody getting used to this very, very quickly. And again, back to what I was saying before, the audience already has green screens, Marvel films, um, books that are read by AI technology, Various, some of the biggest websites in the world right now have an audio component that you can listen to a voice reading the story that not only helps people who aren't afraid of listening to podcasts for a very long time, but they help the sight impaired. They help people who are hearing impaired um, get a better sense for what the rest of the world is listening to. So while they slowly, and I use they meaning them, the big whoever, while they slowly <laughs> creep into technology, not for anything other than just making money, because that's all it always comes down to, is having AI being used 
as a way that we all kind of like to already do. We like seeing Broadway. We like dead people. We still listen to their music. Why not see a dead person live on stage on Broadway? It makes total sense. And it is going to be, you know, coming, I think, a lot faster than what we already realize. Mm. In fact, I've already signed on to, to my estate having conferences with me in it again, <laughs> being an AI chatbot already. I'm going to be cheap. I'm going to be available. And again, I'm going to be a lot smarter than today. <laughs> That answer um, is know, pretty smart I, for a human. <laughs> Sorry, Noah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. I I use I use uh, ChatGPT daily uh, in my work, not for composing emails or anything like that. Like, um, as as somebody who was in grade twelve advanced math and was, was getting ten percent on everything, and then realizing I didn't actually pass grade ten math. Um, <laughs> You're that kid that failed that, math. There's a future for you in the music industry. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it is important for me to, you know, to like calculate harmonics and frequencies and all these kind of things. And I haven't been able to do that before. There are harmonics calculators and resonant frequency calculators, but they're not. You need to understand the language. With ChatGPT, I can explain in, in, in plain language what I'm trying to do. I'm saying I'm running a Two triode. I've got. I've got. Uh, I've got a one k tone, and I'm getting a resonant uh, harmonics at at two k, three k, five k. Is the five k like is 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 that correct for a triode? Like I don't. I can literally just say that, and it can tell me if that's correct or not. Um, also, there's a a DAW digital audio workstation called Reaper. Um, I don't. I don't use it often. Uh, uh, ChatGPT is trained on the entire uh, script language in it. So oh, you wow. can, in plain words, you could say exactly what you want to that Reaper doesn't natively do, and it will give you the script language. You can insert that into Reaper, and it will create a script, basically just a one-button push, and it will do exactly what you ask it to do. So when those tools come out available to the engineer, available to the musician, uh, the more those tools come out, the, the better the more efficient we'll, we will be in creating. It doesn't affect the artist, the artistry at all. It's when it goes into the artistry, when it goes into the actual mastering, the thing that I do, what I use my human emotions to do, and it does a poor job is when it's a problem. But when it aids me in certain tools, uh, it's a phenomenal thing, especially using plain, plain language. If I haven't been able to, I can't just put that in Google. In plain language, Google gives me a bunch of random sites. JPT mm. gives me the actual answer I'm looking for. Hey, Noah, can I ask you a question? Do you feel that yeah. the fear or net positive of AI today, is it any different or similar to when you were around in your position when Auto-Tune or GarageBand was around? Do you see any similarities or any big differences between that? Because that was no, the because game changer things, for so many people too. Yeah. Sure. No, those things didn't take away the artistry. The problem is AI, a lot of AI models are, are doing art, whatever you want to, how you want to define it. And those are then being monetized. I have no problem with AI that's doing art at all. Until it's monetized, it turns sort of turn into this business that it's creating something that's, that, that, that humans are particularly good at creating. You know, it's like, and now we got a whole discussion what's art and what is not art, but I don't think it's the same because those are just tools. AI is a tool is phenomenal. AI tool as an artist as as an artist is is, is scary and not good at all. I yeah, anyone else? I mean, it's interesting from the consumer's point of view, I can see how this ability to resurrect musicians who may have passed away, to have their voices create new music could be appealing. It's a way of you know, experiencing it in this novel way. But then at the same time, I start to wonder, will working musicians today suddenly be competing more so with like new music by older artists who are no longer actually around? Is it going to be even harder for them to get their voices out there to consumers? Probably, um, because if we look at the data from Luminate last year on our like consumption in Canada, we already consume like 73% of our music is like catalog music. So already like the market for like 
frontline music is so tiny. Um, but yeah, like working musicians are probably going to have to like, you know, feel the, feel the competition a little bit more. Um, and again, especially when we have like big corporations making big strategic like partnerships with these AI um, companies and they have like that ability to you know, pull stems and just have a very, like make new sound recordings with a very low transaction cost. Totally. And I mean, there's other ones too, not just like the Beatles. I saw a couple I, today. It was like um, an AI company called Endo and uh, Rhino, which is a subsidiary of Warner Music. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, they took Roberta Flax, Killing Me Softly. Uh, they took stems from that song and created three like soundscape albums with it. So I think we'll see probably more of that. And then just like also, I think Eric was like touching upon it, just like weird like marketing sort of things that we'll see too. Like I saw one uh, between like Sony legacy recordings and some AI startup and they had like a David Gilmore album that they, you know, the, the, the consumer could like type in like, you know, a couple of terms and it'll just like make like a AI album art like based on the terms that they were like putting in. Mm -hmm. So like stuff like that. Yeah, I made the mistake of, putting out my first song on the same day as now and then. And I immediately fired myself as my manager and was like, you should do better, Todd. Come on. It's better than that. But Todd, I, I have a great example how I used AI to, to really aid in my work. So I was doing a, I was giving a Leonard Cohen song, an old Leonard Cohen song um, called Avalanche. And I was given the 24 tracks. And I'm not a mixing guy. I sat down with a mixing engineer and I was told, what they needed to do, they needed stems. They didn't have stems. So I had to remix it and master it. So it sounded identical to the original. Very hard to do with not a studio full of 1970s technology. So I sent it to uh, La 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 Da A and I had it, I had it put out into stems. Now I'm not going to use those stems because they're not great, um, especially for a stereo track. But then I listened to each of those stems and we were, we, we were able to remix the track in order to sound as closely to those things as possible without all the artifacts it has in it. Although in the future, if they can do it without artifacts and they won't need us at all. But for now, it was a great tool for me to listen to what the voice sounded like on its own, what the reverb sounded like on its own, and then recreate that using software. So, and I had to do that manually, but it was a really great tool to do that. But in the same respect, one of my clients uh, came in with a song and I was like, wow, these drums are amazing. What's on here? And he's like, dude, it's the drums from Subdivision. I just took it from the Rush song. So he loaded into the same kind of program, took out, took out Subdivision drums, recut them up, Neil Peart's drums, and recut them up and turned it into a new song. And it's like indistinguishable, but it was still Neil, Neil Peart playing. It was really cool. I mean, I'm, I won't tell you who the artist was because he'll probably get a lot of but, but that, But that's no different than, um, than Lil Nas X buying beats right and then he ended up buying the beat of of nine inch nails from trent reznor that somebody had ripped off and like he was forced to give credit to trent reznor and atticus ross for one of the biggest songs in music history so you know but that's fascinating though that, like you know <laughs> when you kind of neil Pert, yeah. like you know you suddenly have to give neil pert to state something yeah i i saw that an interview with damon alburn where he basically said yeah this the whole beat from Clint Eastwood is just the number one preset on the Casio. And he played it for the, I think it was Zane Lowe from Apple Music. And it was just like, boink. And then I'm like, I love that song. Why? Like, that, that's incredible. So it, it's not sort of like this new thing where technology has just sort of come out of nowhere and, and sort of blindsided musicians. And then at one point, technology did help to sell new formats and reach more people and was working well. Um, do you think the benefits will vary significantly across, you know, different stakeholders within music? So we've talked a little bit about how it may hurt or help some artists, whether it's legacy acts versus discovering new music and so on. Do you think labels are already benefiting from it? Like are, are they ultimately going to be the stakeholder that, that benefits the most? Or do you think it's tech companies sort of the way all the streaming is, is, it's not people who love music who run the streaming services, I don't think. I mean, the CEO of Spotify might be a music fan, I imagine, but, um, you know, it's not like 
labels or artists are starting streaming typically and, and so on. So do you see sort of like some people working it out or working out for them and others not at all kind of thing? Like, is there an imbalance, do you think, potentially? Oh, well, the, you know, figures that came out this week said that the, the global music industry is worth $28.8 billion. So I would say that if I'm Warner, Sony or Universal, I'm loving the fact that AI exists. And while they continue, while, the, while the, the, the three major labels continue to have absolutely dominating bonkers amount of profit, they're still laying off thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world because they realize that, you know, maybe this new technology, not necessarily AI specifically or chat GPT, um, but you know, they can minimize their losses a lot more by just waiting to sign artists that have 4 million streams to hit the button and make them go to 40 million streams. But the days of signing an artist with 20,000 streams to bring it to 2 million or a Bruce Springsteen that took three albums or Bob Dylan that took four albums to break is long gone. So the music industry is in fine shape depending on where you are. Live, amazing. Live aspect, bonkers amount of money. And I like Ticketmaster and I love Live Nation because I don't put the blame on them for any of the high ticket prices. It's all the artists that get to decide. But when it comes down to the major labels, yeah, I'm not crying for them at all. And I don't think they're crying for themselves. I think they, they know exactly what they want. And any time that they see another company like that Swedish company that just got caught or that, that, that composer that put 50, you know, 2,500 songs up on Spotify and had 15 billion streams. The only reason why they're complaining is because they're taking revenue away from themselves. You know, that's it. They don't care about fairness. They have no interest in a level playing field. They want to destroy all competition. That's their game. They don't really, they've got no other self-interest and rightfully so. They are a profit-making company designed to make profit. So, you know, I think it sucks if you're going to be an independent artist because you are going to be competing not only with the real live you know, amazing artists from yesteryear, but now you're going to be create. You're going to you're going to be in competition with, you know, box sets coming out at least digitally every year from every single major artist who catalog is still in the vault. To some extent, too, I think AI can democratize the process of making music in that maybe you're somebody who wasn't born with a beautiful voice, but you've always had this urge to be creative and to get your ideas out there and heard, you can now potentially use AI to compensate for that. Or if you didn't have the chance to learn a musician as a, or learn an instrument as a child, you could still create this new music and reach some fans at least. So on the one side, it could benefit people who had always wanted the opportunity to make music and couldn't before, but then we're also seeing how through democratizing it, competition is going to go way up and for any individual, it might become more challenging. I love uh, that. I mean, that's a very- I, I love that thought. Yeah, though. that's a- it, You know, while, you know, like Noah, like you and I, and I, I, I'm sure everybody here knows, like <laughs> the first thing that the government, any government does when it wants to cut back in the education system is cut back on music and arts. And I think you bring up an excellent point that this could level the playing field for a lot of, um, you know, lower income class students in neighborhoods that don't have access to arts. Because we all know what music can do to somebody, not only, you know, mentally and physically, but they get better grades in English and math and communications and they have better people skills. So I love the fact that you brought that up. I, my problem with it, though, is that it's a very like, benevolent way of looking at, at AI technology. And, um, you know, and, and we're a bit spoiled with ChatGPT because, you know, ChatGPT3, most of us can use it for free. And we've got it on our phones and it's really helping our lives. But, but it's like the crack pillar, right? Because it's like, like ChatGPT5 comes along and it's like 100 bucks a month. It's going to be like your cell phone. Like you have to have it. So our companies going to come that are going to be altruistic and create music creation tools 
that are free for poor people to use or for poor musicians to use, you know, or is it going to be more expensive than it was in the past? You know, it's like that, you know, someone buy a high dollar guitar and create beautiful music, you know, at a campfire. Now, will they have to spend thousands of dollars to create artificial music just so they can feel like they're the team? So um, I guess the, if we can encourage the, the benevolent use of AI, it, it'd be great, but I just don't, but based on what's happened in the past, I don't really see it going that way. I'm just picturing people at campfires now pressing <laughs> buttons on their phone to create it. What did you think of that song? I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. So <laughs> terrible. Um, should I also admit that? Can I ask Kelsey a question? Also. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'll just be quick about this. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, on the same page as Noah. My kind of problem with democratizing um, music making, and I'm not being a gatekeeper here at all. I'm just kind of pointing out that it devalues like musical training. Like, you know, for the folks that have spent tens of thousands of thousands of hours training at their craft, just for someone to be able to like pump in a couple of like prompts and then like put out a song. I just don't know if it could like ever be equal, you know? Yeah. Are you against like, always, always paying gamic or whatever that, that diapil is for all those people who, who work out every single day of their lives and then all of a sudden the diapil comes along and you lose like 18 pounds in a day. Isn't that kind of what this is like now? Where it's like everybody's, what's it called? Oza? Ozempic. Oza yeah. Ozempic. That's it. That's it. Whoever is going to put this online needs to tag Ozempic because we'll probably end up getting a, a million. Um, can I, can I actually ask Chelsea a question? How yeah. for, from from C, from your association point of view? Yeah. Um, do you have a lot of conversations with the with local government, with federal government? Are you looking at what the copyright rules and uh, like other countries are passing in order to to protect the the indie style that normally tends to kind of be left out of the conversation? So mm -hmm. where where are you going, and how do you feel things are going when it comes to actually protecting? You know, because music is one thing. As a dad, oh my God, I'm I'm scared to death knowing that somebody can start posting revenge porn or mm -hmm. photos that we've seen of celebrities. Look what happened with Taylor Swift only a couple of weeks ago, where that went viral very, very quickly. So, from from Seema's point of view, what what's going on there in terms of like the ideas and what you think is going to happen when it comes to copyright? Yeah, so we are like in conversation with the government right now. The government had um, consultations about just the future of like Copyright Act in, in AI. So they sent us a bunch of questions and we filled them out. And basically right now, our main concern is, yes, of course, like deep fakes and things like that can uh, really infringe on like your moral rights and your likeness and your reputation and things like that. But what we're mostly concerned about is that these models are built on copyrighted work that's scraped. Um, there's no transparency in what's being used and nobody's being paid for this. Um, so we're really concerned with like the input side and that's kind of where we've landed so far. We have looked at other, uh, like what other countries have um, like implemented in terms of copyright, um, but I just don't have that in my brain. So yeah. I can't tell you, but that's but kind of where we're at. Do you see, the copyright laws that are in place in Canada, do you see them needing to be changed based on AI and 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 things like that? It's kind of like, mm. I, this is a really bad analogy, yeah. but one of the reasons why some people don't like specific religions or race being added on to the hate crime bills is because there's already a hate crime bill in mm. there. Mm -hmm. um, but people want special status, like Black Lives Matter. So using that awful analogy, do, are we are artists protected already through the means of, of using their copyright material? Because I know a lot of artists, they probably don't even know. Um, so the Copyright Act as it stands now can apply to like the input side. So we, in our consultation, uh, basically said like, 
as the Copyright Act stands now, we don't think that there needs to be any sort of changes or any exemptions or there shouldn't be any exemptions, obviously, for like AI developers. But as we as it reads, um, we could apply the Copyright Act and that text and data mining um, for AI, to, like the use to develop AI, is a licensable right. So we see this sort of market-based solution that could, um, you know, come out of this. The other thing that it, is a bit of a challenge too is just the fact that there's no transparency and there's really no like there's no really reason why a corporation would be transparent about like what data they're using to feed their AI models because we don't have any sort of like watchdog organizations um, in place like if you do research at a university in Canada like there's a research ethics board and it's just like such a tedious process you have there's so much about like where are you getting your data? Where are you storing your data? What are you doing with your data? Like there's so much in like the, you know, you have to basically give like the, the lifetime of like what you did with your data to get to your research results, but corporations don't have that. So basically right now as, as it's functioning is that these AI developers are sort of just going along the lines of, you know, use now and ask for forgiveness later. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, we've already used this. So how can we, you know, make this work basically with the rights holders? Is that what's going on with I, the New York, I, I, with like, the, like the New York Times and the the copyright mm -hmm. laws and suing? Is that is that is that something like that? Does I don't know. know what I'm no, I okay. haven't read about that. So yeah, I guess yeah, yeah, it. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, I think, suing them for inputting all of their articles without their permission, and then also you could get behind paywall access articles through asking AI the right questions. And then obviously authors aren't getting credit for any of that or any kind of compensation. Yeah, I just don't think we need a repeat of, of, of home taping is killing music and the CDR <laughs> fiasco, all these things that got legislated that, that really just hurt creators in the end. You know, it was, uh, of course, it blew that all out the window, but, but you know, that like, to like a copyright is important, but you know, it's like also, you know, we put data out there and it, it, there's you know it, legislating it out legislating to the point where it's just uh it, it sucks all the life about it not either do you think we're sort of at the point where it's ai is an ethical issue and then eventually it'll become a legal space like it'll it'll transition from because not even that long ago people could say whatever they wanted online about someone else and you couldn't couldn't really do anything about it. And then eventually it got legislated. Do you think we're sort of in the, the ethical space right now and then eventually it'll get to a, a legal place or a policy place, Chelsea? After AI has its first kill, yeah, the, it'll be a <laughs> yeah. legislative thing for sure. Right? I mean, for all of us who grew up seeing the Terminator in theaters, this is so scary right now, right? But. <laughs> um, um. I mean, the government is like working through like how to regulate AI developers right now with Bill C-27. So it is something that's like sort of moving through and it's been reading at the House of Commons. But as we know, change is slow. <laughs> so <laughs> could be a very long time till we see this. And by that time, I mean, it could be outdated because this technology is just so quick to develop. Yeah, I, I wondered what, as a music fan, myself and just I love having music on at all times except for now I've given an hour and a half of my life without music on in the background for this this talk of course but um do you think fans will gravitate towards artists who who come right out and say I don't use AI or do you think they'll even distinguish between artists who do use it and don't use it or do you think artists like that Boston album that said no synthesizers were used in the making of this album? Oh, or yeah, I was thinking of like Rage Against the Machine too, when they're like every single sound on this album was made from like guitar, bass, and drums and vocals and, and stuff like that. But and funded by a, a, a major label, like hypocrites. Right. Oh, everybody's <laughs> a hypocrite. Everybody is a plant. Everybody is designed <laughs> to be sold. Um, I I like to just essentially burn all my bridges and say that that this planet is doomed and we're all for the most part <laughs> idiots like i don't I, I don't put anything past the general public to do anything ethical i don't 
I, you know, we deserve the politician that we get. We deserve the celebrities that we get. And the, I, I'm not so sure that the audience out there or the fans really collectively have a problem with, with fakery, with, you know, mostly because I think collectively we're idiots. Uh, separate, we're pretty smart. But one thing that that really interested me to get my my really negative opinion on it, um, and I see I I'm an idiot because I completely forgot it. Um, the ability for the audience to always decide what they want is something that that you really don't have any control over so you can be as authentic and real as you want but this generation of 8 to 15 year olds who are growing up and not only surviving but thriving on platforms like TikTok who used to have older brothers and sisters and parents who basically forged a fakery of a life on Instagram through the we all know the massive psychological and mental health impact but we're still on it because we're just addicted to it. And the ability for that generation, for the last two generations to realize that they still enjoy watching fake things happen in front of them. I'm not convinced that being authentic means anything anymore because I grew up thinking that it did. I grew up thinking that Bruce Springsteen was more authentic than Madonna, than even though I loved them both, or that, you know, Depeche Mode was more authentic because they sung about S and M, and Boy George did, or you know, they were all faking it. Bruce Springsteen <laughs> does not walk around with a white T-shirt and jeans. You know, he is a multi. He's been very well rewarded for his work. So I think you can be really independent and being authentic. But I think after a certain level, once you become a commodity. I think you have to start changing it. I don't think the audience really cares so much as long as they feel mm -hmm. that something is relatable to them. But the resurgence of analog is kind of the is kind of the analog to that, in the sense that analog is authentic. Analog is a physical, a physical thing. Whether it's a media, whether it's a format like vinyl or cassette, or equipment like I have behind me here, it's analog equipment. So there is definitely a resurgence of analog um around the world it's a, it's a viable business right now and there's an authenticity to that over digital digital's ones and zeros it's a representation of what it is so analog is the actual thing exists in the physical world so i think i think consumers response in saying yeah we do want analog things we do want we do want uh, we don't film we want polaroids we want vinyl we want cassettes and that resurgence you know i mean Vinyl's sold better in the past, you know, year than it has in the past 20. So um, I think that is a response to that. That Yeah, there is TikTok. There's all this stuff. There's this fluidity. But then there's the real constant, which is the, the resurgence of analog. So I think there is that authenticness there. So you actually answered our first audience question, really. We're still 10 minutes away from the Q&A, but you nailed okay. the answer. I read recently, too, that um, vinyl records were included in the consumer price index again for the first time in something like 30 years because of the vinyl resurgence and I thought yay <laughs> kind of like I don't know I, I feel like I'm the worst person to host this because I've never used chat GPT so um full disclosure maybe that should have been like my opening line is like I've never used what we're talking about for the next <laughs> hour so I'm like, I mean chat GPT is the intent it is the antithesis of analog, right? It's, it's, it's as most digital as you could possibly get. So I think there's a yin yang here that the more we get into this world, the more that we crave the physical and vinyl is physical. Vinyl is a hundred percent physical. There's nothing else other than physics in vinyl. Not, not to be cynical though, the, ex you know, as consumers perhaps want to have more of this analog, more of this real, it may also create an incentive for artists to just hide the fact that they have been using ChatGPT or hide the fact that they are using AI in other ways. So it will it will always be hard for a consumer to know, is it really completely you as an artist? Or is there a line somewhere where I accept this much AI, but not AI beyond this point? 
Um, it's it's a really fuzzy it's a fuzzy question. Yeah, and I think well, you could create an AI album and then put it on vinyl. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking of you know most of us as fans would be fine with an artist data mining to personalize their their set list based on saying okay this song is well I was joking about that thing that happened with me with the my song being played in Helsinki randomly by an AI playlist or whatever but if the artist this specific song resonates in Chicago or Toronto or Vancouver I don't think anyone who attends that concert is is going to be upset but will there be I don't know, is it really different from like Millie Vanilli or whatever being caught not being able to sing? Is it now, is this the new version of like people who can't sing or can't play or can't create chords or can't create a melody and, and stuff and now they can? So are they just going to get, is it sort of like the, the use of attractive people to sing on the CNC Music Factory songs <laughs> instead of the person who actually sang it and things? Is it just a new new iteration of that, for example, or that, that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, I wondered as well. Um, so Chelsea, I don't want to like just put the spotlight on you, but I kind of have policy questions if that's okay. okay. Um, how hard is it to get something related to copyright for the arts and for music on, on the radar? Because, I mean, obviously there's going to be um, a specific ministry that has a mandate related to this area mm -hmm. it feels like the federal election is happening tomorrow based on sort of like the media coverage and polls mm -hmm. and discussion of cost of living and affordable housing and and so on and so on how do you get it on the policy makers in front of them and and get them to prioritize it is it um yeah, so I think, well, the first thing is that SEMA has been around for a very, very long time, and we've always been a stakeholder in these sort of like governance like issues. So we have a really, really good relationship already with um, like Canada Heritage and uh, the now I can't, it's ISED, it's like the Economic Development Science Innovation um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Department. So we're already kind of like in a strong position there. And because we act as like this collective voice for the industry, we already are sort of like at a, in a better position because we're so collectively organized already. And because the government like comes to us and asks us to participate in round tables and things like that, where we can give the perspective of the Canadian owned industry. Um, and yeah, I know it's like hard to like think about why the arts are important when it's like cauliflower is like seven ninety nine and rents like a million dollars and people can't afford houses and you can see homelessness problems and things like that. But the thing I think to like always remember is that the music industry is an industry and and we generate um, GDP and you know sound recording it generates something of like one point three billion to the GDP each year. So it is in the government's interest to like sort of like keep this industry like happy and healthy um so yeah i mean we just had like a very successful uh campaign at sema actually to uh raise the canada music fund and so uh it was probably one of the best campaigns that we've had so far we were like highly organized with organizations like throughout the industry uh, we did a letter writing campaign we got over six thousand signatures um handed six thousand letters on the desk of of the minister and that's where we got the attention and our file was like very very well known throughout the throughout the ministry so you know collective organization join sema <laughs> <laughs> the, the I'm glad that you got all six thousand letters that I sent in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna no, say no, but congratulations though. The, you, you know what? Like really, like congratulations because the amount of money that they that they announced during the Junos is is so good for the, yeah. the music industry. Yeah, and we Canada were, we're Post was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thousand letters with stamps i love it no no we we we, we went to staples and printed them out okay. and hand delivered them to the minister and, and then renewed your health card at the same time anyway <laughs> oh wait sorry totally second. um yeah sorry kirsten you're in vancouver so you don't know that 
and you can get your driver's license renewed at Office Depot now. <laughs> no, I did not know that. It's crazy times out there in Ontario, but totally they're not related to business matters necessarily. Um, okay, so we have uh, just a couple of minutes of of my questions, and so we're we're going to shift over to some of the the questions from the audience. And um, so one of the questions is, how can AI assist in addressing or worsen the issue of algorithmic bias in music recommendations and, and ensure fair representation and visibility for artists? Is that like a utopian wish for it to be fair and equal representation and visibility for artists? Is, or can we make AI more ethical? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Speaking of Reddit, um, I'll I'll just answer. I'll just say something really quickly. Yeah, I have noticed a, a huge amount of online chatter in the last two months, begging recommendations on how to change the recommendation that Spotify is giving them. Um, it is. Mm. Um, it's kind of funny because I never would have thought about this that people would be complaining about it, but people tend to like variety when they want to. And sometimes Spotify specifically, and I'm not only focusing on them, this was just the complaint that I kept seeing on Reddit over and over again, was like, do I have to start listening to classical or jazz or just stream it, an album in the middle of the night just to mess up the algorithm because it keeps giving me sad songs or it keeps giving me pop songs by female artists or by women artists. Um, so yeah, you know, part of, I'd love to say something like it would be amazing if in the potential increase that the Canadian government is going to maybe impose on Canadian rail stations to play X amount of Indigenous music specifically, it would be amazing if Spotify was under those rules too, or iTunes or Apple. I know that they won't but variety is good. And sometimes people don't know what they want. And look, nobody asked for the iPod. You know, nobody asked for Spotify. Nobody asked for the Beatles. Nobody asked for the Sex Pistols. Sometimes the audience just doesn't know what they want. But when they get too much of the sameness, it's kind of like my wife's cooking. You kind of just want to go out every once in a while, even though it's really good. You know what I mean? No one asked for nine years of business matters discussions, but we're here. We're here. I'm just exactly. kidding. Exactly. We didn't know how good it was going to be when we started nine years ago, right? So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, how do you influence the algorithms to make them more equitable or more or less biased? I don't really know. Or, or, or more importantly, how do you ensure that bad actors don't get involved? with the algorithm in order to ram things down people's throats that they may or may not want in the first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's there's that, but I think also you need to like look at how these models are built and who is building them and what it's being trained on because there was a report and I can't remember what it was called something in the AI. But what I took away from it is that there's only about 14% of people working and developing like and training AI that are women. It's not looking good for, you know, um, like gender disparity, right? So there's gonna be like already a gender bias in what these things are being fed. And then I'm sure if we look down to like racial and sexual and all these other things that, yeah, these could potentially just reinforce these social and historical biases that we've had for, you know, eons. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's still, re my son is eight and one of his friends told him that singing is, is for girls. So I, this is a little tangential, but I said, Liam, who are all your favorite artists? And he listed them off and it was just, it was all male artists. We're like, well, let's listen to some female artists or let's listen to some different kind of music because my eight year old's already like listening to the 90s white rock bands that I listened to as a kid or whatever. So it's like, I can see the, the, that it could happen with his Spotify playlists and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. He's not going to get exposed to stuff beyond Nirvana and Zeppelin and the Beatles and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And that's sad too. So 
Yeah. All bands I like to dress up as women at one time or another, by the way. Right? Yeah. It's, it, I mean, yeah, it's it's been uh, eye opening for Liam sometimes to see like some live artists from the 60s and 70s and stuff. And one of the funniest things he said to me recently is he asked if Robert, when Led Zeppelin songs come on, he's like, oh, do they have a, a female lead singer too? And I said, no, no, that's yeah. just always Robert Plant. He's like, oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> um, there's another question from the audience. I sh should have worn my reading glasses, but I didn't. Um, aside from the government, are there any other important stakeholders external to the music industry that, that will influence how AI impacts musicians and other workers in the industry? So, I mean, I guess that would include NGOs or, I don't know, think tanks, research institutes, I'm not sure. Um, Sort of tech cool. companies probably yeah <laughs> That's the big one that i can think of i was trying to think of ones that would have a positive impact <laughs> 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 so, sorry life oh, size. All right. <laughs> um yeah i mean it, it it's it's exactly to my first point is that all these companies that are doing ai mastering and like ai mastering is really a case study because i don't think there's one other um industry uh, that's so sort of unique that has so many AI models, like so many businesses that do what I do. And, and you know, just, just uh, 10 years ago, just explaining to people what I do was difficult. I had all these stupid analogies about, I'm the, like the frame of the picture, but the lighting too, it's like it, it, none of any sense. And now there's, you could never explain what mastering was. Now there's, you know, like ten, uh, dozens of websites that offer master, but these are just, technology companies they're not sometimes they have a token audio engineer behind them or a token musician behind them but for the most part they're just they're just tech companies and they're so these tech companies that are just trying to make you know three dollars here five dollars here are really shaping the way people think what mastering is so these are people not in the music industry not in the audio engineering industry who are uh, real time changing how how people think of what my industry is and it's that's really, really frightening. And no, since mastering is so under the radar, no one's really noticing it. But every week, there's a new site that goes up. There's one that's that's very similar to ChatGPT. You actually type in in real, in real language what you want the song to sound like. You say, "I like this song bright and sound like it's analog and comes from tape, and and maybe a little bit like the Foo Fighters." And then it will do mastering based on that. It's her, it's awful. Like it's it's really bad, and I don't understand how machine learning can make it better because it doesn't make any sense. Where are they going to learn how to make it better? Nonetheless, it, it exists out there. So these these technology companies that have no stake in the music industry or in the audio en engineering industry are shaping how people think of what audio mastering is, and that's that's pretty scary to me. Is it solely, are they positioning themselves based on sort of price and speed? Sort of like huzzah, you're- yeah, some, of them, some of them are free. Yeah. And one of them, who's a, a colleague of mine, he has his own. I kid you not, this one's actually pretty good. I kid you not, it's a full analog console and a fucking robot arm that like, that, that does this, goes and changes the settings in real time, but it's all AI and it's, it, Literally, it's a robot arm that does it. it. Actually, sounds pretty good. It's the only one I know that's actually in a lot. <laughs> but the rest, the rest are just these like these these algorithms that are just are, are just are just are just doing it. And it's fast, uh, and it, it doesn't objectively. It really does not sound very good. Right. It, it seems similar too to what we're seeing with writing in that having AI generate this ad copy, it just sounds so generic and it doesn't really connect. And I'm scared that maybe it will change what people think writing should be. If that's all we're constantly fed, will the same thing happen with music, this poorly mastered sound, but that actually becomes what we start to expect. Like that would be so sad for us. Yeah, or like, make me sound authentic, please. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So terrifying. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we have a few more questions. And actually, the, the, this question is something I was thinking about asking you anyway. So this is great. It said, uh, it says, where do you think listeners are on this topic? Will we have 
non-AI music labels like we have non-GMO food. So when I lived in New Zealand, they had this really big push about genetically modified. And so they had all these people had cars with bumper stickers that said, say no to GM and they, it didn't say GMO. So I was like, oh, do they not like General Motors? <laughs> like, What's going on? I'm so confused. Um, but they meant GMO. So do you see it labeling like non AI music labels? I remember as a kid when it was actually a draw to say, oh, there's like bad language on this album. Now I really want to buy it when it had the ex explicit lyric sticker and, and stuff like that. Do you think that will ever happen? Um, quite possibly. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think quite possibly. Uh, mainly because the way that like copyright law works right now is that it applies to like a human creator. So there's not like a real clarity on, you know, how do you have to disclose whether there's AI or not, or like, where do you sort of draw the line between, you know, how much AI makes it AI generated. Um, so I think like maybe eventually we will see this sort of like labeling come into play. Um, yeah, especially just so, like for transparency for the consumer too. Yeah, I've used something called rhyme zone and you put in the word and a whole bunch of rhyming words plus endings of sounds of words that sound similar that you can use and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, so then if I have an entire verse written, is that by something else like is that cheating or yeah and yeah. even labeling when it comes to things like free range versus organic and and so on are sort of muddy like in some mm -hmm. places it's like well if you open up the chicken coop for 15 minutes and encourage the chickens to run around then it's free range they don't actually have to leave <laughs> but if if you encourage them and be like run free chickens you you can label it as as free range or, you know, if X percent of the ingredients are organic, you can label it organic. So, yeah, it feels tricky and complicated to come up with sort of like a rating system of this is like C-level AI or something like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the we, new we, album. We, we, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say quickly that the new album by, uh, I don't remember their name, but uh, they're, in, I, I think, Big Thief and um and uh it's a pretty big album right now and it's being marketed as all analog from the beginning to the very very end so that's anti-digital anti anti-everything so there is some labeling in that respect yeah, yeah we, we already yeah. use a, a little bit of labels when it comes to the music industry specifically with the with the maple logo with you know defining at least 50 percent or 25 percent or 100 percent of the music the artist, the production being done here in Canada and the, and the lyrics. Um, what's interesting is around the same time last year, the Grammys and the Junos both came out um, within a month of one another explaining that if there was a high percentage of AI being used for the specific category that they would not allow it. I don't know about anybody else here, but I'm going to venture to say that the music industry is not one of the most ethical industries in the world. So you can't really, you know, if, if you leave it up to whoever is doing the submitting or at least, you know, signing off on, there's no way that they're going to tell the truth. There's just no way. Um, not if it doesn't affect their their profits or their sales in the end of it although that i have seen recently a whole bunch of artists do lean into the fact that they are going to create a whole album using nothing but ai technology um i can't remember was it ludic was it ludicrous i think it was who announced that and you know people you know it's a trending topic for like you know 25 minutes like most mm -hmm. things are um and it'll do really really well for the first day because everybody's going to want to listen to it and you know again the audience will decide on whether or not if they want it but it's interesting that the rules of the junos and the grammys have tr are trying to specifically designate what a percentage might be in order to create that label and it's a start and i think mm -hmm. that once they do that then i think people like chelsea and and all the associations will have to start working with that or against that yeah it makes me think of organizations and industries that have voluntary standards and when you think of 
voluntary standards in, in like clothing industry and uh, related to pollution and employment and so on. And I mean, of course, this is sort of outside of the discussion, but because you mentioned about voluntarily providing that information, I don't know how many people think advertisers will Zero. Sort of blow the whistle Zero. on you and be like, Zero. no. We Not, know that already. Yeah. Sports fans know that from the baseball steroid era. We yeah. zero. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. So, um, we have another question. It says uh, Chelsea mentioned how AI is replicating music creation and downplaying uh, the, the long term dedication to training that artists go through. Um, but they go in a different direction with the question. On the other hand, how can AI revolutionize? Uh, music education and skill development for musicians. So it doesn't necessarily have to be Chelsea. That's it. So I didn't mean to be like, oh, you have to. Um, they just mentioned what, what you were saying about the training. Yeah. So. I mean, I have a quick answer for that. Like, um, a, I can't teach you how to play an instrument, but you can ask it theoretical questions and dig into the theory. So maybe your compositions are a little more thoughtful um without having to you know do hours and hours and hours of like classwork learning mm -hmm. kind of get that instantaneous answer so say you're like oh i want to you know write a, a moody melancholic song what what key would be the best to write that in like what key gives that sort of feeling and then you know it'll spit out an answer for you yeah, one of my colleagues um, asked ChatGPT to write um, a song for the MBA students to learn about living in Niagara and going to university at Brock. And it even had all the chords and it came up with the lyrics and he shared it with us within, you know, two minutes. And I was mm -hmm. like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I mean, he, he can play, like he, he plays live gigs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he's a jazz piano player, but he was like, hey, look what, this this came up with in in sort of no time whatsoever yeah um one of the another question here uh it says thanks for doing this of course um it says rob here hello rob i'm an artist a composer and musician as a music creator i have to say i do fall into the net negative category if we're handing over music making and inherently human activity to computers I guess I just wonder what happens when we fast forward, say 10 years, 30 years, or 50 years, when AI has the capacity to do everything that a human can do, where does that take us all? What's the end game here? I, I'm just glad that he's thinking Earth will be around in 30 to 50 years. <laughs> That's very optimistic. We had climate change matters a couple of years ago. <laughs> no one left that, that talk feeling good. So um, that's good. 30, 30 to, to circle years. back, yeah. To, to circle back on what I said about the resurgence of analog, I think. Um, I mean, again, my opinion, and this is what the core of my opinion about AI is that it, it's going to lack the the empathy to fully understand music. Like empathy is one thing; it's never going to be able to be programmed. And empathy, like how we really connect with music, and we, we we our emotions, like we hear the lyrics, and we and we it makes us, you know, it I, like experience of listening to music at a campfire there's nothing like it nothing can replicate it so i think everything's secular and like i think if we go to ai music people will just crave like the singer songwriter they'll just start go back to creating craving human music and that thing that always happens is why vinyl one of the one of the many reasons why vinyl came back one of the reasons why analog films coming back we just crave that 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 je ne sais quoi that can't be created on computers and it's being driven by young people, not being driven like the, the biggest buyers of, of vinyl are young people, not people our age, <laughs> you know, for not, we're not buying it for nostalgic reasons. 50% of people who buy vinyl don't even have record players, but they will, you know, they just buy it. And it's like, and that they can always play that in the future. So I believe that, that, that no matter where we go, so good, art is still gonna come from humans. I don't think we can ever replace that personally. I find mm -hmm. it always curious to think that <clears throat> that I could live to 103 if I'm going to be around for 50 years down the road, which I plan on living forever anyway. But I'm always curious 
to think about the fact that computers were supposed to help make our lives easier in the beginning of it. And I find it wildly ironic that AI is being used now to create art. The one thing that people would want to do, I think mostly in their spare time, had they saved time from working. Computers and AI could be helping us get more free time, more leisure time. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm working more <laughs> hours and harder and longer than ever before, like most people. And I just find it incredibly ironic that we're talking about AI doing art when that's supposed to be our There's job. You were promised flying cars, flying cars. <laughs> never happened. <laughs> Yeah, like no lightsabers. Where's our Jetsons? Where's our robot made? Yeah. 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 All those shows that w when they say this is what 2024 is supposed to look like of movies made in the 70s and 80s, it was, yeah, very, very, very different. But I, I did wonder too, like the, so when you, we've been talking about vinyl resurgence, how, like how big are the sales or the, the actual size of the vinyl market? in comparison to, you know, yesteryear. Like, I, I know it's not going to be... Doesn't, um, okay, it doesn't mean how, how big it is and how, how much it's selling. What matters is that there were, like, you know, in 2011, there was, like, four plants making vinyl. Now they're in the hundreds, right. in, if not in the thousands worldwide. So it, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the end number doesn't matter as much as how much it's growing it's growing at this exponential rate about the the industry behind vinyl it's yeah it's a, it's a huge industry now and it used to be a it used to be a dead industry yeah when i was yeah. when they switch made the format switch of the introduction of cds i remember everyone just sort of like throwing out tapes and records back then it was just this huge blowback against other formats and it was kind of a strange thing when you look back on it what I meant in, in terms of like the numbers is, is it sustainable for artists as well if they are gonna rely on like vinyl sales, for example, so. No, they can't. There's 49.61 million vinyl albums sold in 2023. Taylor Swift was responsible for 7% of that. I can guarantee you that the major labels hate vinyl records. They don't want it. They don't want physical product because it's it's expensive and it's costly to make and there's shipping is a nightmare they want everybody on digital is there an, an environmental argument to be made as well in terms of the the production of vinyl and um but then of course it's awful. yeah so i don't know i i once heard that it's more it's more environmentally damaging to have music streaming services than it is for vinyl records because of the energy used because the energy it's like uh like bitcoin fascinating but it wastes like whatever the measurement is <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, yeah, it's just harder for us to conceptualize so it seems like it's not there it seems like there's no waste but absolutely there is mm -hmm. how do you see chat gpd and ai use your stuff kirsten like in like 20 years does it make it easier for you so this is a big question in academia right now that in theory, people can generate articles almost instantly. And how is that gonna affect research, what we believe? Uh, and we have no idea. So right now, when you submit an article to be published, you basically check a box that says, I, I'm saying that I did not use AI in the generation of this data or this writing, but we know that that's not a very good safeguard. So our industry is grappling with these questions, maybe not quite as existentially as music, but certainly in terms of what it means to publish a paper now, what it means to collect data now. Uh, so everything is being disrupted. But why why is that so different? I mean, it goes back to what I was asking about Noah. How is that? I Because I, I'm not asking for, you know, I'm not asking ironically, like, other than just double checking your sources and triple checking it, why would the academia world frown upon using AI as opposed to a book or or a website that might be looking reputable, but not? 
probably part of the answer is that AI isn't good enough yet. So right now the AI is generating answers that are questionable, where you can't trace where the information came from. But in theory, if it continues to improve at this exponential rate, maybe it will be just as good or better than our current human experts. And if that happens, then we do have some big questions and may no longer yeah. be frowned upon to use AI. Yeah. Chelsea, are, is SEMA using AI right now for like things like billing and royalties and, and doing things a lot quicker? Um, well, we don't collect royalties or anything like that. We collect like membership dues, but no, we still have an accountant and we still work with like Stripe. So we're still doing things like very manually. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Sometimes we use chat GPT to like ask it questions, <laughs> <laughs> polish up some writing, but not much. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, Kirsten, have you ever had an AI journal review of one of your articles? So far, no, I don't think so. But I, that certainly, I imagine, is going to come. So in, in academia, when you submit a paper, they ask other academics to review and give feedback, which is time consuming and difficult. So I suspect that might be one of the first things that academics try to you know, hive off onto AI. Same with activities like grading. So how do you, how do you prevent that? You're yeah. relying on people's ethics at the moment, which Todd, as someone who studies ethics, you know, might not be the most reassuring thing to be falling back upon. Yeah, I, I definitely had one journal that the reviews definitely seemed like AI. They, they were like riddled with sort of like these grammar problem and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, oh man, I don't think I even want to publish in this journal. It was just sort of strange. But one area we haven't really talked about is music writers and, and journalism, for example, and the use of AI for that. And it, it sort of ties on to what I was we were just talking about like if we write an article for our, an academic journal and we use chat gpt to like generate it or whatever um do you think ai is going to put even more music writers out of business is that sort of the the trend or do you think it makes it easier to to share content for writers or what do you think I don't know. I used to buy Rolling Stone magazine, so maybe I'm like an outlier and I, I still have spin magazines at home from that's I was noticing I'm I'm 46 and I'm like explaining all these bands to my son and almost every single one of them, one of the members is not alive. And so I still have all these commemorative spin magazines from when some of my favorite artists passed away. It's like I need happier spin magazine covers at, at home for my son to look through. But do you think music journalism is is going to be impacted in a good yeah, way, it, it, way i mean it already is in terms of of the collective ownership and consolidation it seems like every single day we see magazines um and websites like pitchfork being brought into larger companies we've seen sports illustrated for instance um basically cut back all of their staff and go to video um buzzfeed for instance, if this was 10 years ago, could have created all of their listicles just scouring using AI Reddit for, you know, here are the top 10 responses to blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're, we're seeing it more and more. Record reviews for the most part are, are long gone and dead and probably not gonna come back because these fans sometimes don't wanna read anything um, longer than, you know, a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, but I think, you know, lists are really good using AI. Um, I actually, whenever I'm doing an interview sometimes of like the best guitarist of all time, yeah, I'm throwing, I'm throwing chat GPT in there just to see and make sure that I'm not forgetting the obvious so I don't get a lot of hate emails and go, how could you forget, blah, blah. Um, so we're seeing it already. And again, I think it comes down to what, what I was saying before that you can go either way on it but the audience will decide on what they love and right now there's just a hunger for clicks and anything that is gets some controversy is going to be winning and if it helps you in your outlet create five thousand articles a week about every possible spectrum of the political realm you're going to do it you know and i wonder if there's but I hate it. But I hate oh, it, though. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if yeah. 
if AI is just able to say, yes, this is the most clickbaity title you can come up with for your, your article and send or hit send. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, we also haven't really talked about radio, but I also realize it's 757. So we don't really have um, huge amounts of, of time for additional topics. We actually don't have any um, additional questions from the audience at, at this point. Does anyone have any sort of high level predictions of what you think is coming next or exciting things? If we want to end on more of like a, a positive note versus cut scene to the Terminators as our, our send off music. I, I, okay, <laughs> I'll give my prediction. I think there's going to be in the next couple of years going to be a massive, massive hit that was all done by AI. Like I'm talking massive hit. And then for a while, everyone's going to be over it. It's like it's it'll, it'll hit peak music creation sometime in the next few years uh and then everyone's gonna be like okay it, it, it's like gangnam style it'll be like that and nobody wants to hear anything that sounds anything like that for a long while that's my prediction yeah i'm feel i'm i'm on the same page as noah i do wonder too if society's like attention span can even handle like being focused on ai for more than like a couple of years before they bounce to like the next thing Yeah, it doesn't even feel like that long ago that it was like social media was in everyone's attention and things just change so quickly and so much, so many floods of information daily. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, anyone else? Hopefully uh, for you and I, Todd, the research that we're planning to do can gather information from people all throughout different parts of the music industry and at the very least highlight what some of the issues and the concerns are so that we can have some influence on policy and just make make a positive difference that way at least for me as someone outside the industry that can be my role yeah that's that's what i i love about talking to people in music is that i just love what they do um and yeah noah you were talking about like how songs can connect with you and that this will be my chance to be like i still have a lot of your songs on my playlist and i love them and i still listen to a bunch of your songs uh, so it does make it does make a huge impact and a big difference i got i got, I got new ones come first time in 12 years actually, i actually been working on it for 12 years ai did not help me with this so yeah i i have little bird on my one of my playlists i'm like oh, a, such a beautiful thank song thank so good so really nice. please thank do you. check out noah's work too um and and check out everything else we do like go go to fraser valley and take a course with kirsten come to brock take a course with no i'm just kidding um but anyways thank you so much um as i went really fast because you all have such interesting opinions and good things to say so um thank you so much for being part of the the panel um thank you for everyone who is watching at home um i think we have like a one minute moment where we 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 kind of stare into the distance and think about deep thoughts while we shift off from the live stream um, uh, that, that takes place now. So yeah, again, thank you so much. Um, have a great night. And we'll have to do this again in 10 years when something else weird is happening in music that we can't quite explain. <laughs>